Don't I get a last request? You'll get nothing and like it. Tell it like it is, sister. Oh, great Athena, we give you this virgin as a sacrifice to your beauty and womanhood. Did she say virgin? Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Horton Peake. He's like the most confident guy in the world, even though he's a complete moron. Hello? Hello, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. It's your pen pal, Johnny Bravo. Pretty girls treat me right. Hey! Johnny Bravo! Hey! Johnny Bravo, you too. Johnny's gonna put some gun pow on you. Sometimes in life, the virgin is the Chad. It's a stretch, but I think I could pull it off. When people talk about the classic shows of Cartoon Network, you always hear the same answers. Dexter, Powerpuff Girls, Cow and Chicken if you're nasty. <laughs> but one show that always comes up from everybody, except Cartoon Network themselves, is Johnny Bravo. Hello, 911 emergency. There's a handsome guy in my house. Oh, <laughs> Wait a second, cancel that. It's only me. This was the very next cartoon cartoon after Dexter, and back then, you could tell it. This dude was everywhere, and for a while, he kind of became the face of the channel. But nowadays, you'll be lucky if Cartoon Never will even tweet about him. Oh, mama. Still working that, huh? What's that? I scrolled all the way to the bottom of their Twitter, and the only thing I saw was them reposting one fan art. There is a tweet celebrating the 25th anniversary of Cow and Chicken. Johnny premiered the day before it. You need to acknowledge me. Man, they didn't even show him in the 30th anniversary livestream. I know the show's premise of guy hits on girls that doesn't want him is outdated, but if Mickey Mouse is still walking the streets, Johnny should be too. They got your mans on sex assault charges. Yeah, the nigga you be hanging with. <laughs> the nigga you be hanging with. Just slap a whoopee disclaimer on it and play the stupid cartoon. It's kinda worse if you ignore it. This is the only cartoon cartoon not made by a white guy. They're racists. They're literally gaming racist. So today, I'm doing what Cartoon Network is too much of a coward to do, and give Johnny a proper in celebration. Yeah, whatever. I'm your host and verified pickup artist, D'Angelo Edwards. And today, I'm taking my hat off to Johnny Bravo. Before we start, I'm happy to say that I'm partnered with Mint Mobile. Does your phone bill ever feel like it's getting way too high? Like, where is all that money going to? 5G, unlimited talk and text, mobile hotspots? Mint Mobile offers all of this and more for as low as $15 a month. Mint Mobile is built on the nation's largest 5G network. And since they sell to you directly online, they can cut you a better deal. You can save money and avoid the soul-crushing act of talking to an actual store employee. And in case you're worried about the hassle of switching carriers, it can be done as little as 15 minutes. That's like one cartoon with bumpers, you can handle it. And with digital eSIM cards, you can sign up and activate immediately. And if your phone doesn't have an eSIM, Mint will send you a SIM card for free. After trying Mint, I can guarantee you won't notice any change in speed or quality from your current carrier. You can just keep binging those soap cutting videos. Big Wireless wants you to think that they're the only option, but that isn't true. You can go to trymintmobile.com slash hats off or use my link in the description to stop paying more than you have to for your phone plan. And right now, new customers can get any plan for just $15 a month when they purchase 3 months or more. This includes the unlimited plan, which is normally $30 a month. Use that money you saved for something nice. Buy a yo-yo ball, it's 2024, no one's looking. Once again, you can go to trymidmobile.com slash hats off or click my link in the description to stop paying more than you have to for your phone plan. What's your typical day? Well, I'm a new recruit. I'm new, so um, okay. they get me up at five because they say that my hair isn't trained yet. All right, 
before we get into the show itself, I think it would be cool to talk a little bit about the show's creator, Van Partable. I'm Van Partable and I created the cartoon Johnny Bravo. He was born in the Philippines, but ended up moving to America when he was only nine months old. And after a few years of comic collecting and yearly trips to Disneyland, Van had basically all but decided that he was gonna be an artist when he grew up. I swear, the only thing more dangerous than crack is nerd stuff, dude, not even once. Anyway, with his head full of spandex and his stomach full of Mickey pretzels, Van decided to pursue his art career and went to Loyola Marymount University for his animation degree. For his thesis film, he decided to do a short about three different Elvis impersonators fighting crime together. Only thing about that... Because it was one semester and I was doing the whole thing, I... I, I whittled it down to one. So the three Elvi were squeezed into one, and Van made Messel Blues, the short that would go on to inspire Johnny Bravo. Now, right out of college, Van didn't really have much luck in the industry. He was couch surfing and working afternoons at a daycare school. A Lutheran school, I might add, which means he was pulling double duty, teaching kids and protecting those cheeks. They were spanking anyone back then, dude. <laughs> <laughs> But back to Van, dude basically had no prospects at the time when he got a call from his teacher who had got a call from his buddy that worked at Hanna-Barbera. And this little game of telephone would end up having a big change on Van's life. I'm talking big, like, whoa! His teacher was asked to submit some of his more talented students' thesis films for a new shorts program they were working on in Hanna-Barbera. And he wanted to know if Van was interested. Which, yeah, dumb question. Dude was barely in his 20s and he was being asked to pitch in front of one of the biggest cartoon studios around. If someone had told me I'd be pitching the cartoon to network right out of school, I'd be there with a pen ready to sign and a mouth ready to open. Despite the great opportunity, Van thought he had bombed at the pitch. He had come overdressed and halfway through showing his student film, Fred Siebert, yes that Fred Siebert, walked out of the room. I mean, I know he probably had something important to take care of, but when the Quincy Jones of TV animation walks out during your pitch, it's hard not to freak out. No one even looked at the portfolio Van brought. I guess all you can do is laugh. Luckily though, despite thinking that the show could have been a bit more cartoony, they agreed to let him add a new part to emphasize the humor. Shockingly, it wasn't the dudes that had Johnny's back, it was the women in the room. Ellen Cockrell, Janet Mazzotti, and Julie Kane Rich, who really pushed for the short to get made. So yeah, checkmate atheists, the ladies really do love Johnny Bravo. Van always thought that women tended to enjoy the show, since a lot of them have a Johnny or two in their lives. And what could be funnier than watching that dude get beat up? And now, the project was a go, and Van officially had a new job at Hanna-Barbera. And soon, the world will be introduced to his creation. But before we talk about that, we have to tell a story about a Danish, a swimsuit, and a little guy called Space Ghosts. Aren't you late for something? Mm mm. No. Oh, I get it. Get a haircut, McCracken. All righty! So, Van's cartoon and a bunch of others had just been picked up. Now the only problem was finding a way to get them out in front of people. And they had cooked up a doozy of a way to show them off. The world premiere tune-in would be a huge special event. Simulcasted on Cartoon Network, TBS, and TNT. Neat. You know, I've been told I use too many Family Guy clips in these videos, so I think I'll just get most of them out the way now. Yo, the check's in the mail, Seth. But yeah, this world premiere tune-in special would be hosted by none other than Space Ghost himself on a special episode of Coast to Coast. And besides it literally being one of the funniest episodes of the show... Huh? What are you saying, boy? What are you saying? I can't understand a word you're saying! This would also serve as our first look at some of the shorts, even though some shorts got more of a look than others. Uh, I make cartoons. I make uh, the Powerpuff Girls about these three little kindergarten age superheroes who fly around and beat up bad guys. Oh, let's see the clip. That's great! But most importantly for this video, we actually got our first look at Johnny Bravo, along with some top tier van interaction. Food, food. You have a Danish. Yes. Give me the Danish. Okie dokie. No van, it's a trick. He'll take your whole hand. No, I doubt it, but it would be funny. He's like my favorite of the group, which is saying something since Gindy was there too. We only get to see a few moments of the short, and what we did see was unfinished, 
but this would be the world's first look at Johnny Bravo, and what a way to do it. Nowadays, there's just no pageantry anymore, it's just the same old song and dance. The show gets greenlit, the pilot leaks online, and then maybe three years later you get one season and some tissues to wipe the mascara off your face because your new favorite show just got cancelled. Yes, I'm talking about Seis Manos, and no, I'm not over it. But this was a cool way to get the word out about this new program. They did other cool stuff too, like starting the dive-in theater, where shorts for the program would be played at swimming pools and water parks. They showed Johnny in one of them, and you could even pick up this cool inflatable Johnny YouTube. <laughs> I don't know what that outline is, and I'm too afraid to ask. But eventually, starting in February 26, 1995, Cartoon Network would begin airing shorts once a night on Sundays, under the name of World Premiere Tunes. Before we change and get back to the original name of the shorts program, and the name most of us are familiar with, the What A Cartoon Show. Say, uh, what's the matter, little mama? Our prize gorilla has escaped from its cage. Really? Really? Enough about you, let's talk about me, Johnny Bravo. Three different shorts for the What A Cartoon Show were made for Johnny over the course of three years, with the first one simply called Johnny Bravo, the next one being a pitch for a middle cartoon, you know, like Evil Concarde was originally called Jungle Boy, and the last and most iconic one in my opinion, Johnny and the Amazon Women. You wanna see my chest hair? It's blonde and curly. They called Johnny a virgin and trapped him on Fabio Island. If that's not funny, you got oil in your blood, I can't help you. This was our first real look at the big lump, and I think he did a pretty good job at explaining the purpose of the show, which I just realized I haven't done that yet. How many minutes in are we? Made a mistake. But Johnny Bravo follows the man himself, a guy who thinks he's God's gift to women. Good thing God included a gift receipt though, because they want nothing to do with him. <laughs> This usually leads to him trying and failing to get the girl, usually with a lot of pain coming Johnny's way, either from the world or the woman herself. Johnny has what we call display muscles. They're meant to be fashionable, not functional, like fake fruit or the government. I was gonna put him uh, foot. Funny enough though, in the first short, we do see him put up a pretty good fight against the crocodile. It's one of the few times we actually see him hold his own in a fight, but I'm sure Van and the team realized it would be funnier if such a buff dude spent more time kissing the pavement than girls. If you're used to watching Johnny Bravo, but not the original shorts, he looks a little weird compared to what he would become. A lot of times, they don't even draw him with real hands, just like little Animal Crossing stubs. The characters also look a lot more simple, which I'm sure helped in the animation process, especially since this was basically Van's first real animation job. Oh my god, his first job was his own show. I, I just need a- I need a- I need a mo- <laughs> Alright, I'm back. Yeah, even before the short, Johnny went through a lot of changes. I mean, look at the Popeye arms he used to have. He of course started as a straight Elvis impersonator, but you can't really get much out of that, so Van added other touches to him. The looks of James Dean, the flair of Michael Jackson, and not forgetting his roots, the mannerisms of old Snake Hips himself. All this stuff mixed together came to us in the form of the full Bravo package. No assembly required. You chicks are pretty. Come on, do the monkey with me. Come on. One thing that is on full display here in the shorts is the style of animation they decided to use for the show. Back when Van was still working on his original thesis short, the same teacher that got him into the program suggested that he watch the Dover Boys, since he was having trouble animating his whole project by himself. And from that advice, Van developed a love of smear animation. I was watching this one short, this Warner Brothers short called The Dover Boys, and they had this smear technique where you would have one position here, and if you had to get over here, you would just do this giant smear. So instead of in-betweening all these things, you would just have one giant drawing. I'm like, I love that. That cuts down on my animation. And it worked perfectly for Johnny. With all the poses and gestures he does, that snappy pose-to-pose -pose way of animating lent itself pretty well to the show. It's a little janky here and there, especially during this scene of Johnny bravoing all over the place. But that's what pilots are for. Gotta iron out the kinks. But this interesting style of animation helped it stand out among the other shorts. And stand out it must have because after the third short, the show was greenlit for its first season. Hey, baby. Whoa! 
It's been a while since I've seen it, but man, that first season of Johnny Bravo is iconic, super funny, and full of some of the show's most memorable moments. After making the shorts, Van and his team knew that the world of Johnny Bravo needed people around to help make it feel more alive, and also show that Johnny wasn't just some drifter going from place to place. And so, more main characters were added. First off, we have Johnny's overbearing yet loving mother, Bunny Bravo. Citizens of Aaron City, me and a few of the girls have formed an angry mob to catch this yarn thief. Bunny is your typical mom character. Sweet, friendly, large and barge. But her basically still raising her fully adult son makes her a pretty interesting character. While she does coddle him, she does push him out of his comfort zone from time to time and doesn't just grant his every wish. If he wants something, Johnny's gonna have to make it happen himself. Mama, I need some money to buy a car. If you want a car so badly, why don't you get a job? <laughs> Adding in his mom really humanizes Johnny too. It shows that he's capable of forming genuine connections outside of just trying to pick up chicks. And him and his mom have some of the sweetest moments in the show together, showing how much they really care about each other. I especially love the episode The Perfect Gift, where Johnny tries his hardest to find a good Mother's Day present for her. I'm supposed to just tell my mama that I love her more than life itself. I mean, I love her more than anything, and I, I couldn't even get her a pair of bunny slippers. Oh. Johnny. Oh. Bunny was voiced by Brenda Vaccaro, a pretty big name in the film and stage business. She had a role on the Gilmore Girls that almost nabbed her an Emmy. She was the first voice of Jay's ex-wife on The Critic, and apparently an old commercial she did went viral back in the day. Though back then that just mean it was parodied on a sketch show. I'm Brenda Vaccaro. I'd like to speak to you about something that means a great deal to me. <laughs> protection. Feminine protection. And I like that. <laughs> I know a lot of people make fun of how many breaths she takes in the ad, but what's got me is how she talks about the tampon she's promoting. Brenda Vaccaro for Playtex Tampons. I think it's important to know the facts about tampons, to use them intelligently, and to know what you're doing. Is that thing loaded down there? What's it in there? Her iconic raspy voice makes Bunny sound sweet, but also like she could knock some sense into you. Perfect for Johnny. I also love that Johnny clearly is getting his sunglasses game from her. A nice little design choice. Also, I have feelings for her, but I'm not telling you which ones. Oh, Bunny, you're so funny. You're like a hanky when my nose is runny. Besides Johnny's mom, though, there's another little woman in his life. Like, literally. You wanna come to my- No! Susie is Johnny's polar opposite, a tiny girl that's both smart and witty, who just won't leave this big dumb idiot alone. Most of the time she's either forcing Johnny to play with her, or telling him that whatever he's up to is a bad idea. The crew created her specifically to give Johnny a girl that was completely off the market, you know, with the whole child thing. She was his intellectual equal, probably smarter than him. We had to put a girl in there that Johnny couldn't possibly go after. And I thought it was just a cute dynamic of this little innocent girl and this big, like, clueless guy. Though he does make a crazy joke about her. Hi, Johnny. This is little Susie from next door. Will you come to my birthday party today? I am busy. Call me in 15 years when you're a co-ed. I really like the relationship the two of them have. Though in some episodes, it seems like she has a schoolgirl crush on him. Most of the time, they're more like a big brother and his annoying little sister. Seeing how easily she can trick him and get him to agree to whatever she wants is always funny. And sometimes it's even a little cute. Like, Johnny is obviously annoyed by her, but you can tell he kinda cares about her too. Some of the episodes show that Johnny is actually pretty good with kids. Probably because he's not much smarter than one. Wanna see me coma? My hair really fast. <laughs> Either way, it's a fun dynamic and her design is adorable. But enough about little Susie because we gotta talk about her voice actor, who has been on top of the world since she started. Heck, basically since she popped out of the womb. Faster! Mae Whitman has been in the biz since she was two years old. She's had a bunch of roles and stuff like Independence Day and some show called Chicago Hope, but who cares about all that? She went on to have some major roles in animation. 
Rose in American Dragon, Katara in Avatar, Wonder Girl in Young Justice, April O'Neil in TMNT 2012, and Amity Blight in Owl House. Not to mention, she was Roxy in Scott Pilgrim, both live action and anime. Save some pussy for the rest of us, holy shit. This is a working girl. She has done nothing but breathe air and succeed since she took her first steps, and I love that for her. And Little Susie is no less of an iconic role, but let's get back to the main man himself for a while. I think that Season 1 Johnny is my favorite version of the character. I'll get into that later in the video, but every season kind of reinvents him in small but noticeable ways. But this Johnny is the perfect sweet spot. He's dumb, but he's not a total idiot. He has moments of genuine kindness intercut with his usual selfishness. And sometimes, he can even hold his own in a fight. I also find how they portray his relationship with women pretty compelling. Like, think about it for a sec. This is a guy with no friends except a little girl and his mom. He's got no dad and was basically raised on television. So all of his preconceptions about what it means to be a man comes from kung fu movies and workout ads. On TV, the buff swaggering dude always gets the girl, and in Johnny's experience, the only two girls he has experience with love him unconditionally. So of course he thinks that all women must think the same and act like the ones on TV. He thinks they drool over muscle, so he's constantly working out. He thinks they all love unbridled confidence, so he's always showing off. It's the only thing he knows, and that doesn't make his actions okay, but it makes them make sense. And in certain episodes, when he does somehow manage to get a date, he's actually shown to be a pretty decent dude. Like, in those episodes where he goes out on a date with an antelope and a werewolf. Which, first off, Johnny Bravo, down to Uwu confirmed. But also, he showed them both a pretty good time. He tries his best to be a gentleman even if his dates aren't what he expected. He can for sure still be a jerk, and he is a lot of the time. Ah, them dishes coming, Larry! Just about finished. Come on, say it. Sir, I knew you could do it. <laughs> and I'm not saying that all of his dates go well. A lot of them are disasters. <laughs> but I think what's important in this kind of show, where the characters are never going to grow much, that we get to see these moments. Show that he's capable of being a decent dude. But besides all that stuff, the guy is just funny to watch. Excuse me while I make a wish. Buffalo. Just seeing him get beat up and thrown around just absolutely destroyed. While he does his iconic yell will never not be entertaining. <laughs> Jeff Bennett never fails, but I forgot just how good he was as Johnny. Just watch a couple of episodes and try not to do the voice. Impossible. Van wanted Jeff to do a voice that was somewhere between young and old Elvis and Jeff took that advice and ran with it, adding his own little flourishes that made Johnny a lasting icon. And speaking of iconic, man the first season really has all the heavy hitters. Like the sensitive male, which is basically just one giant schoolhouse rock reference, even featuring the original singer for Conjunction Junction in I'm Just a Bill. Sensitivity, sensitivity, show that girl you Really give a deep, show her your mind is occupied with more than the pictures in the TV guide. Van was a big fan of Schoolhouse Rock, so it was cool that he got to do this episode. I also love the one that's just one big Twilight Zone reference, because that's where we got this scene. Honk, honk. Quick, put that away. You know what the internet does to clown girls. There's also just all the different guest stars the show had on. Back when they made Jungle Boy to basically be the middle cartoon for Johnny, they decided instead to just do episodes where Johnny Bravo would meet other big names from the old days, which was perfect for such a rockabilly style character as Johnny Bravo. They had people like Farrah Fawcett and Donny Osmond, who actually became a big part of the show later on, appearing several times. I remember always really liking his design. Like they really sat down and said, let's draw the least threatening white guy you've ever seen. Adam West was another one, and probably my favorite of the bunch. Him and Johnny worked so well together. I'd honestly just watch a show about them. Now, as I'm sure you know, Jenny. Johnny. Nick. 
The crew loved having him on too. Jeff actually stopped and just turned and said, you're a freaking nut, huh? You're a freaking nut, aren't you, Adam? That's why I would lose it when we were working together, you know? I'd have a line and he'd say, uh, Johnny, let's go find your mama. This was actually the first time that Seth MacFarlane and Butch Hartman, who had both had Johnny as one of their first bigger jobs, met the guy, and he would go on to have recurring roles on both of their shows. Catman for Fairly Odd Parents, and of course, Mayor Adam West for Family Guy. Dude really was a legend. Rest in peace, man. Adam West, Adam West. But of course, the most famous episode of this season has gotta be their crossover with Scooby-Doo. I'm on my way to visit my Aunt Jibadiza, and I'd sure hate to be late. She lives in this spooky house up on Widow's Peak. Spooky house? Jinkies! Jinkies? I remember when I was a kid, this was one of the coolest things ever. And it made perfect sense too. Scooby-Doo was always teaming up with people. Even way back in the day, Batman, the Addams Family, the Harlem Globetrotters, they had Don Knotts on twice. Man, there's just something about old cartoons and Don Knotts that I really don't understand, but it's still so funny. They even reference him in the episode. But man, this one rules. Just Johnny and the gang teaming up to look for his missing aunt. It's full of classic Scooby gags that Johnny ends up putting a fun twist on. Like when both him and Velma lose their glasses. My glasses! I can't see without my glasses! My glasses! I can't be seen without my glasses! There's also the famous splitting up part where they finally just turn the subtext into text with Fred and Daphne. Scooby, you and Fred check upstairs. Velma and I look in the basement. Daphne? I mean, Scooby, you and Velma check upstairs, and Fred and I look in the basement. Also, this is one time where I am not on Johnny's side at all. He had Velma throwing herself at him, and he didn't do a thing. If it was me, the only mystery there'd be to solve is, is this a plus or a minus? But this episode is great. It has all the makings of a classic Scooby episode, with Johnny kind of fitting right in. They actually went through the archives and used as much original music and model sheets as they could. Even the walk cycles were the same. They also got a lot of the original voice actors back from the Where Are You crew. Casey Kasem, Frank Welker, and Heather North all returned as Shaggy, Fred, and Daphne. Though Nicole Jaffe had retired, so they got BJ Ward to fill in for Velma, which is perfectly fine by me. She's my favorite Velma easily. And with Don Messick having recently had a stroke, they got Hadley K to fill in for Scooby, which is funny because Frank was right there, and he's basically been Scooby-Doo forever now. Besides doing all the voice and the look stuff, they even got consultation help from Joe Barbera himself and Wow Kakamoto, the original character designer for Scooby-Doo. I love his stuff, man. This is still one of my my favorite drawings of the gang. The only one that comes close is this picture of Velma that Dan Haskett drew. Van even got the chance to hold a private screening with just him and Joe. And even though he nodded off a little, because, you know, old, he still really liked it and said that Van and his team really kept the integrity of the original show intact. For me, this is definitely one of the funniest episodes of the show, and one of the ones I think about the most. A perfect combination of Cartoon Network and Hanna-Barbera, and a sweet little tribute to one of the longest running franchises out there. Hey, little mama. How about you and I spending a little time mono e mono or stereo? Where are you going? I'm a dancer, romancer. You're a Capricorn, I'm a Cancer. Wait, come back. Put on your shades because a huge Johnny Bravo is clearing out all the clouds and bringing with it plenty of sunshine and warm temperatures. After the first season of the show, it proved to be really popular. All my friends watched it. There wasn't a kid around who didn't laugh if you went, hoo, hoo, hoo. Even my grandma liked Johnny Bravo. I remember this was one of the only cartoons that she liked. He was all over the channel too. Tons of iconic commercials and appearances. They even pulled from that Scooby-Doo episode and kept pairing him up with Velma. Except this time, he acted like he had some sense that was actually into her. I miss back when cartoons used to act different off the clock. Like all the different 
different shows were just jobs they had to go to, it went a long way towards making them feel like real people. But despite the pretty good reviews, the show was basically put on infinite hiatus after the first season. I didn't even notice back then that I was just watching the same 13 episodes over and over again for two years. The crew had even thought up some new ideas for the next season, like making the sensitive male a recurring character, and adding a new character, Holly O'Hare, a super headstrong woman that would have finally put Johnny in his place for good. They even wanted to do more episodes with Adam West, maybe even possibly making it into the middle cartoon. But the worst thing of all was that during the takeover of Turner by Warner Brothers, the company decided to make more seasons of Johnny Bravo. The only problem was, they wanted to do it without Van and his original team. Just like that? Just like that. They fired Van, Seth, Butch, and Pat Ventura, who I am still waiting for to make a cartoon. Just give me more Sledgehammer Opossum. It was such a strong team, and they just threw everyone out. Seth and Butch have even talked about it before. I did work on Johnny Bravo. That was actually where I got my start at Hanna-Barbera slash Cartoon Network. I was a writer and part-time storyboard artist for Johnny Bravo for uh, season one. And then they fired us all and got some new guys and you know, that's, that's when the show went south. But outside of the team, you can't even imagine how Van felt. Imagine your first job, your first job, getting to be making exactly what you want and then just having it taken away from you. This isn't like Dexter when Gindy wanted to leave. They gave Van the boot and he didn't have any say in it. In an article for LMU Magazine, Van wrote, I can only compare it to being forced to give up your baby for adoption and watching it go to parents who were making choices you didn't agree with. They claimed it was because they wanted to get someone with more experience to run the show. And yeah, that's understandable. Van was straight out of college and for a lot of people on the team, it was their first job too. Van basically had to learn how to make a cartoon as he went along and Cartoon Network was growing, they had to start thinking about their bottom dollar. But it's still just such a scummy thing to do. If it had been me, I would have rather just left it cancelled. But it is what it is, and there's no changing stuff now. So let's see what Johnny and the gang were cooking with in season 2 and 3. Well, hello, shiny mamas. We are two enticing females who wish to commence dating rituals with you. Hmm. Usually I like to make the first move. Let me think about it. Okay, I thought about it. Alright, so going from the original Van season to the new seasons that started up back in 1999 was actually not as jarring as I thought it would be. With Van gone, they instead got Kirk Tingblad, who was a major asset having worked on a ton of stuff before like Tiny Toons and Animaniacs, to be the new showrunner and director. The look of the show was completely changed, which isn't necessarily a bad thing most of the time. Hi Johnny! Look, I lost a tooth! Wish I could unsee that! Johnny's proportions got more exaggerated, Johnny's mom got hotter, and Susie got less cute. There's actually a lot of things I prefer about the look of the show here. First of all, I love the more angular look of the series. Bolder outlines and sharp poses galore. The backgrounds also got a bit more detailed, but not overly so, and pushed it more into the realm of Cartoon Network, rather than Hanna-Barbera. Not that the more Hanna-Barbera leanings of the original season were bad, I just kinda preferred this look overall, especially in the first half of season 2, where they were still doing most things traditionally. Seeing this gorgeous line art in colors on cells is a sight to behold, dude. This is such a good looking show in the second season. The third season kept things mostly the same, but by then they had switched to digital colors and it just didn't look as good to me. But besides the look, a lot of other things changed as well. Like, for one thing, they added two new characters. The first is Pops, the shady owner of Johnny's favorite diner. 
always out to make a quick buck, no matter how much he has to exploit Johnny. I could make a fortune off this! A fortune, huh? What's in it for me? Why, uh, you can watch me make a fortune off this! Ah, man. He's one of my favorite additions to the show. Voiced by Larry Drake, he's always ready to give Johnny some terrible advice or feed them what can, at least legally, be called food. He's almost like a prototype Mr. Krabs in some way. I wonder if someone snuck over to Nickelodeon to see what they were cooking up there. Wouldn't be the first time. Johnny! Besides Pops, you also had the introduction of Johnny's nerdy best frenemy, Carl... <laughs> my feelings on Carl are mixed. I do like him, but sometimes he can be a little much. It was a pretty simple move to add him to the show. Pair of the big buff jock with the scrawny nerd, that's textbook stuff. And a lot of the time they do work off each other pretty well. Lieutenant Biff, what's his name, reporting for duty, what are your stupid orders? Give me a foot rub. What? Not a chance, dweeb. Then prepare to be disciplined. <laughs> I like the one where him and Johnny live together, in episodes where it's him and Pops teaming up either against Johnny or to help him. It's just that some of the times... <laughs> I'll kick his ass. Someone ought to kick his ass. Look, sometimes he's just a little annoying, okay? And I know that's the point. He's supposed to be annoying. But sometimes he annoys me more than seeing Johnny annoyed makes me laugh. Like, fire is hot, but that doesn't mean I like getting burned. I feel like a little Carl goes a long way. And they definitely leaned on him a bit too much. I just prefer Susie and Pops over him. Surprisingly enough, looking around the internet, he was kind of a fan favorite. But I think that's just because you're used to hearing him for 22 minutes a day. I had to watch this show for hours at a time. That does something to a man. As for the episodes themselves, those are also a mixed bag. There are some really funny ones, like genuinely some of my favorite of the series. I love the one where Johnny gets abducted, or the one where he goes to a live taping of a kid's show and goes full animal farm. And the one where he goes to Mexico has hands down one of the funniest lines of the series. Surely a girl as pretty as you has kissed a man before. What? I was young. It, it was New Year's Eve. The cherry cola made me giddy. Granddad, I think I might be. It's okay, son. I just wish the show hadn't removed itself from what made it so unique. Like, Johnny always had, like, a hint of nostalgia to it. Like, in season one, the guest stars they were getting were all at their peak in the 60s and 70s. That added to the charm of the show, that you could still make it so funny using guest stars that I barely knew anything about. Also, with people like Seth MacFarlane, Ruben Petkoff, and even Elmer himself handling a lot of the writing in season one, it felt like the dialogue and even some of the characterization took a bit of a hit. Like, Johnny himself is still really funny, and a lot of that is again due to the fantastic work of Jeff Bennett. But it feels like they made him way stupider, without keeping that bit of charm he had in the original season. The plot and situations were wackier, but some episodes just weren't that funny. Maybe I wouldn't have noticed this as much if I hadn't binged it, but still, it kinda became a slog after a while. I wouldn't say it ever got terrible, but the changes were felt. Overall, Season 2 has my favorite look of the series, and some pretty strong episodes. But some of the back half of it in Season 3 just wasn't as good to me. Also, there's an episode where Bunny goes on a date, and that's supposed to be me! You're not my daddy! But I could be the dad who stepped up! So yeah, Johnny Bravo returns to the network, for better or for worse. But this is really when Johnny Fever hit the nation. You could not escape this dude. He was hosting Fridays all the time. They made even more bumpers. And if you were buying CN merch back then, you can bet he was in every group shot. In addition to hosting Fridays, he was also the host of the first 13th annual Fancy Anvil Awards. A fun little award show the network did back when they gave up. There were special guest stars like Al Roker and even star of little vampire Jonathan Lipnicki. Woo! Where's my autograph book? And they even had super cool awards like, <laughs> like best female. Oh my god, I just realized that I am making a Johnny Bravo video right at the tail end of Women's History Month. Guess there's nothing else to say but... I'm sorry, women. 
They even gave Johnny an entire spin-off show called JBVO. It was a blog hosted by the J-Man himself, where he would take viewers' calls and put on any show they requested. Only problem is that it was limited to shows shorter than half an hour, so no big stuff. Except one episode where they did agree to play Dragon Ball Z, but at two times the speed with Johnny talking all over it. Wow, okay, there's that floating half-body guy. Goku, uh, flying or doing something over there. Frieza hurls some kind of fireball at him. Oh, man, this is... All right, okay. There you go. Kind of loses something fast forward, doesn't it, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. It didn't last long, but the fact that this even happened at all just proves how popular Johnny was at the time. There was even a version of this that aired later in the UK called Viva Los Bravo. But instead of calling in for requests, kids would vote on shows to play online. There's also one more show he had, Toon FM, which looked like it was a more fleshed out version of JBVO, adding Brack as a co-host. This one and Viva Los Bravo are pretty much completely lost right now, but there are a couple of ads out there for Toon FM. It looks really cool. Apparently they were live in Japan at some point. We've got Zilla even. Sign me up dude, I love all three of those guys. JBVO aired from 2000 to 2001, with Toon FM airing around the same time, while Viva Los Bravo aired from 2005 to 2006, which by that time the show was over. They really did used to give this dude so much love back in the day, which makes it even weirder that he never shows up anymore. Like dude, at one point in 2005, Johnny almost became the official mascot for the Atlanta Braves. I don't see Mike, Lou, or Og doing that. Copyright stuff did prevent this from happening though, but he did end up becoming the official mascot of Tuner Field, the play area outside of Turner Field. And this looks like so much fun. I would have loved to go. But yeah, Johnny had matured into a mega star for the network, which makes what I'm about to say even worse. <laughs> By the time the year 2000 had hit, Van Partible was basically out of the cartoon business. No one was hiring and his savings were running low. Success had came at him so fast, but before he knew it, they had basically took his show and told him to kick bricks. After discussing things with his wife, he decided to look for jobs outside the industry. He ended up becoming a front desk at the Marriott because he thought his only other skills besides cartooning was with people. In the same article from MLU Magazine, he wrote, I was relieved to have a job again, but inside, I felt a deep sense of shame and failure. I wasn't really prepared to go from earning a six-figure salary to minimum wage. My lowest moment came when my boss brought me into his office and told me, Guess what? I know you've only been here a month, but I'm happy to say that you've earned yourself a 25 cent raise. Isn't that better? Don't you feel better? Don't you feel a lot better now? Don't you feel better? Don't you feel a lot better? Oh my. <laughs> like, dude, this didn't even happen to me, and it still feels like a gut punch. I can only imagine how Van felt at the time, but luckily, Van did not give up. He knew that he had what it took to make it in the industry, and eventually buckled down and got a new pitch meeting with Cartoon Network. Which, yeah, kinda awkward. A little bit like begging your ex to take you back after they hooked up with someone else. But in this world, it's cuck or be cuck. And Ephraim Giovanni Bravo Partable knew what he was owed. Also, have I mentioned that's where Johnny gets his name from? It's just Van's name. Giovanni is just Johnny in Italian. I don't care if I'm repeating myself. This script is long and I'm too tired to scroll up. I made another mistake. Anyway, Van got a meeting to pitch a brand new cartoon. But instead, something a little different happened. The network asked if he wanted to come back and make another season of Johnny Bravo. Come on, baby! Come on! Yes! Come on! He said yes and quit his hotel job on the spot. 
And so, after another two year hiatus, Johnny Bravo was finally back in the hands of its creator. And the first thing Van did was get things back to the way they were. The series received yet another redesign, bringing it back to the look of the original show, with a few of the kinks ironed out. Carl and Pops all but disappeared, which yeah, sorry for y'all Carl heads out there, but at least he still got a few speaking roles. Pops was basically gone gone. Shame too, because I would have liked to see more of him in the original style of the show. But what about the quality of this season? That is a very hard question to answer though, because truthfully, this season is nothing but pure chaos. It is original Johnny Bravo cranked to its maximum. The first episode of the season, Johnny Bravo goes to Hollywood, and it is nothing short of insanity. There's like a talking dinosaur, Jabberjaw is there, freaking Jessica Biel and Alec Baldwin show up, Don Knotts pops up again and raps? This happens? We replaced you with a CGI version of Mark Hamill. I'm ready for my close-ups. You know what? That's it. I'm done. I quit. I give up. I tried. I really tried. It's just a lot to take in when the first season was basically a silent cartoon compared to this. It was jarring at first and I wasn't sure if I liked it, but eventually I got into the show's rhythm and I realized something. This is just Van and his crew having fun with his world again. While I do think that it is a bit much sometimes, it really just takes the show back to its roots and goes balls to the walls. The random guest cameos are back with people like Mr. T and Weird Al showing up, I especially like the Mr. T episode. Him, Johnny, and Susie make a good team. And just finding out that Johnny used to be bullied by a psycho Richard Simmons is the kind of crazy I can get behind. Then how about sweating to this oldie? Not the wet willy! Characters like Donny Osmond and the Sensitive Male return, the Flintstones show up in an episode, and there's even some episodes that explore Johnny's more admirable qualities, like the first season used to do. Like of course, there's the episode Witch A Woman, where Johnny gets turned into a woman just to learn how annoying he is to the opposite sex. It's not the deepest lesson, but it's really cool that they did this, and it was a fun episode overall. Also, the fact that this happened to two completely different Johnnies is hilarious. There's also the episode the time of my life, which explains how Johnny got buff. It turns out that Johnny used to be a scrawny nerd that got picked on by everyone except Sandy Baker, the most popular girl in school. Johnny ends up asking her the prom and shockingly, she says yes. So Johnny decides to bulk up to impress her. Using nothing but protein shakes and a rubber band, what's your excuse? Too bad for Johnny though, he gets stood up on his date and spends the rest of his life wondering what he did wrong. Though after a surprise visit from Sandy, it turns out that in his excitement, he didn't hear her say that while she would have liked to go to prom with him, she's moving away. And Bunny, ever the helicopter parent, never tells him that Sandy tried to come over and explain. It's so bittersweet, because maybe if Sandy hadn't moved away, things might have gone differently for Johnny. He might have even been a productive member of society, instead of just sitting at home all day making YouTube videos. Whoa, where'd that come from? But these episodes are big standouts, not just in this season, but the entire show. I also really like Minnie JB, once again showing off Johnny's affinity for kids, and Double Vision, because it basically gives me two bunnies. Also, this is some good looking television. Sadly, most of the people that had worked on the OG series had moved on by this point. Butch was at Nick, Seth had Family Guy to run, but getting Dan Haskett as an art director is not a bad trade off. With him and the rest of the team, a lot of these episodes are animated so smoothly. The composition is really good too, nice variety of shots to use, really helps set it apart from the other seasons. It's a shame that this was long past the use of cell animation, because I would have loved to see that. You can especially see Dan's hands in the episodes that parody Disney, seeing as Dan is probably best known for his work on The Little Mermaid. Overall, while it's definitely a lot to take in, and it might not be for everyone, I had a pretty good time with season 4. It even ends with a basketball match between Johnny and Shaq versus Seth Green and Huckleberry Hound, and this episode is probably Shaq's best performance by a long shot. Last year's champion who put Shaq to shame, who 
pummeled him with his presence. Who outscored? Outplayed! Well, you just out announced a fool! But all good things have to come to an end, and in August 2004, Johnny aired its final episode. Ratings for the show were dwindling, and Johnny started appearing less and less in the forefront of the network. I'm not even sure if he had that many CN City bumpers. The only significant one I remember is when he hangs out with Jack. That launched exactly one million fanfics. You are kind of cute. You know, you're not bad looking yourself. <laughs> but I guess it was just the show's time. And despite the bumpy road, I'm glad that this time, Van got to go down with the ship. Van is actually doing pretty well right now. He did some work for Disney making one of the shorts in Choi and McShort shorts. He directed the animated sequence in the third season premiere of Medium. And most recently, he directed Pete the Cat on Amazon. And whenever he isn't working in animation, he's teaching it back at his old stomping grounds at LMU. In fact, the only way that you can see the original pilot that started this whole Bravo business is by attending one of his classes, so I probably have a flight to catch soon. But all in all, that's basically where the story of Johnny Bravo ends. But before we wrap things up, let's talk about some of the specials. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. You are conceited. While Van didn't officially return to Johnny until season 4, he actually came back to direct the Christmas special. I don't have much to say about it other than it's a classic, and I still try and watch it every year. Also good to know that the beef is still alive from the first season, after he accidentally decks Santa's halls. Johnny, hold out your hand. There's also the Valentine's Day special, which is one of my favorite Johnny Bravo things, period. It finally shows Johnny meeting a girl that likes him for who he is. And after watching all this Johnny Bravo and learning so much about him, I am so attached to this stupid idiot that I won't lie, I got a little misty-eyed watching him on his dream date. Even though the episode ends with them saying goodbye, in my heart, they definitely find a way to get back together. And then, if by any chance you see this, one, you still look great. And two, please confirm my headcanon. I am begging you. But of course, the craziest thing that Johnny was ever a part of happened halfway across the world. Jeeps, pack your things. We're gonna go make us some Indian movies in Indiana. Johnny In 2009, Van had the opportunity to make a brand new episode of Johnny Bravo, specifically made for India. It was called Johnny Goes to Bollywood, and it was made with an entirely Indian staff. Van had a great time working on the short, and even got to visit India himself. It was really popular, and it even got a nomination at the Anansi International Animated Film Festival. So when Van got the okay to extend the short into a full movie, he jumped at the chance. But this time, the entire cast returned, and so the new and improved Johnny Goes to Bollywood was born. This turned from a little short into a full-blown Bollywood musical, and while I went in expecting not to think much of it, I gotta be honest. This thing isn't half bad. It follows a washed up Johnny Bravo, who travels to India hoping to make it big as a Bollywood hump. Which is crazy because do you just think you can wake up and be Ram and Rama? You think beauty like this is just handed out? I love you Johnny, but stay in your lane. Somehow though, Johnny manages to climb his way up to stardom with the help of two little girls who are basically just Susie stand-ins and a bottle of magic hair gel. All while he competes with Jiggy, who is basically just Indian Johnny and a group of assassins after both their lives. While this thing is definitely rough around the edges, I couldn't help but have fun with it. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, you rang? The thing I was worried about the most was the animation. The movie switched from the normal frame-by-frame -frame style of the show and used rigs instead. While it is a little stiff looking here and there, you can definitely see the effort they put in there. This isn't just another lazy Flash movie, they really tried. Like look at the extra care put into this walk cycle, the animation on Johnny's hair when he first gets the magic gel, and all the fun musical numbers. The music's mostly just okay, but the opening and ending 
song kinda slap. They do a pretty good job translating the show's signature smear animation and quick cuts into flash animation. I really wanna see like a behind the scenes of this thing. Also, it's cool that the two girls are just both of Susie's designs. It's all pretty solid. The writing is okay too. Johnny is as fun as ever and the overall tone feels like season 4. I think the worst parts are probably the dated references. Making fun of Twilight and Avatar doesn't really hit the same in 2024. Heck, it probably didn't even hit the same back then. It comes off very mad. I'll let you come to your own conclusions on what that means. Also, it runs a little too long. I think that they could have shaved off a lot and made like a tight 45 minute special. But honestly, this movie surprised me. I expected to hate it, but I left pleasantly surprised. It won't set your world on fire, but it's not a bad way to kill an hour. And so the time has come to say goodbye. Going back to Johnny Bravo was a wild ride of ups and downs. Corporate scumbaggery and one poor man fighting for the right to make his own cartoon. And honestly, I came out of it with a way bigger appreciation for Johnny Bravo. I forgot just how everywhere this guy was. He was honestly one of the biggest stars on Cartoon Network for a while. I had a Johnny Bravo microphone that I got as a kid from Subway. I didn't go to Subway until I was 10. Who gave me that microphone? And I guess with all that, it hurts all the more that Cartoon Network won't just acknowledge his existence. I'm not asking for a marathon or anything, but show the Christmas special. Put it on checkered pass. Show your freaking second cartoon during the 30th anniversary. I know it's outdated. I know a lot of it hasn't aged the best. But I think that most people are smart enough to recognize a cautionary tale when they see it. A lot of talented people put so much effort into this show. Every bit of it. And this is a character that is beloved literally the world over. And I don't want people to forget about Johnny Bravo. It doesn't deserve to be forgotten. It's funny, it's sweet at times, well animated, and a huge part of Cartoon Network's identity. Maybe they need to take a page out of Johnny's book and learn to be themselves. Because, like it or not, Johnny Bravo is important. And just like the character itself, it demands your attention. So open your eyes and check the pecs, because no matter how much you ignore him, Johnny is here to stay. Do you honestly think women are attracted to that kind of macho attitude? <laughs> so what do you say, you and me go grab some chow? Mama. How many times do I have to tell you I have a boyfriend? Well, you look like the kind of girl that could use two. Hey, baby. Hey, Beverilla, that's a pretty eensy weensy teeny weeny polka dot thingy you got going there. Women, that's slang for babes. When do we leave? I am sickened, but curious. Don't ask questions, kid. Mama warned me about women like you. I was hoping she was right. I'm huge. Hey, look, girls, it's Johnny Bravo. Get him! I'm sorry. Oh, oh. It's her, isn't it? It's, it's not me, it's, it's her, right? You're an idiot. Do these jerks think just because we're totally hot, it's open season to be completely annoying? <laughs> Come and get it, ladies. I'm yours for the taking. Don't touch the glasses. I'm Johnny Bravo, a mister of the universe. I'm here to protect your life. <laughs> you know, they never brought up Johnny's dad. And I think I know why. It's cause it's Van. No one loves Johnny Bravo more than him. And I'm so glad the last season was handed back to him. So for Van and all the other Bravo fans out there, one last time, do the monkey with me. After all the hotness I've brought to the world, you'd think the world would want to give something back. No thanks, Ken. I got better things to think about, like me. This entire planet is being deprived of my pretty. <laughs> Johnny Bravo. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Look out. Oh, mama! A babe! Mercy!